I was a runner for a documentary company called Barraclough Carey, who worked out of Hammersmith. And I got back from traveling in somewhere in the mid 90s and I, I wrote off about 300 letters and I'd studied politics and sort of media and cultural studies as a minor. And, uh, and I got about 200 no's and I, um, I got a couple of yeses, <coughs> a couple of maybes, and one was in this documentary company called Barrow Clough Carey. Went for an interview, got the job. So I was a runner. So my, I, I started as a runner, and I'd been doing some work experience on like a local radio station in, in Essex. And then when Pete, I sort of wanted to give hosting a go. I actually wanted to be an actor, but I don't think I ever really had discipline for it. And because I don't like doing anything more than two takes, which is what I like doing live. So I, uh, I thought I wanted to give hosting a go. And, but it's the sort of thing you never want to just say when, you, when, you, when you're asked, because you always look a bit of a douche. So I, I'd say it kind of quietly after about six months when people said, what do you want to do? And I, and I was very um, insistent I wanted to be a researcher, assistant producer, producer, maybe do, do a bit of directing before moving over. And, um, and a few people started asking me what I wanted to do, and that's what I told them. And then one guy said, there's a screen test going across town um, for a, a pilot show. Uh, called Seaside Special, it's supposed to be the next word. Thank God it never developed into the next word. Um, it was a, a kind of fri fri Friday night, late, late sort of at night entertainment show. And so I, I sent across a picture and a CV and a letter, and I got a screen test out of it. And the screen test turned into a, an audition, and the audition turned into a second audition, and the second audition turned into me getting this pilot. And I just carried on doing my job. I went and I worked on the pilot, and we, we filmed the pilot. Uh, it didn't. It was, I think we did two pilots. Didn't get commissioned, but I, then I had a showreel and an agent out of it. And then same agent I'm with now. And I went back to work and I learned how to be a researcher. And I learned how to be an assistant producer. And I was just breaking into producing when the fruits of that pilot and that showreel and me going across town to do auditions and whatnot um, uh, came to bear, I suppose. And I was able to sort of do it full time. But that first pilot I did, Seaside Special, I did here. So that's why I've always had such a fondness and, and, and romance, I guess, about Fountain. Because Fountain's a really weird place in that it's kind of, like you look at it from the outside and it's nothing special at all. And yet, like, it's, it's kind of nondescript and it's kind of, because it's shouldered between the the old industrial estate which is now turning into flats and and kind of the other side which is kind of looks looks kind of post-war residential it's kind of it almost shouldn't really be here and yet when you come inside if you're a tv person then it gets in your veins and then it's and then it becomes there's something about something about tv studios that are like theaters there's something about you know the grease paint and there's something about just the smell of them and the way the light hits them quite often if, when you're rehearsing and the screen door is open and, and you know, it's a Sunday morning and you've got your coffee in your hand and you see that break in light and you see all the guys outside, um, the hands and, and the riggers just working and the guys sorting the lights out while you're on stage rehearsing and, and going through your lines. And there's something very addictive and mesmeric about that. And once that gets in your blood, it's very, very difficult to, um, to wean yourself off it. It's 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 a fantastic experience, and this place is is has you know it's been crucial to me. So it's I've got a huge soft spot for it. TV is an incredible industry, and it it's it kind of entertainment, especially, doesn't get the credit it deserves. I think um, it's 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 a very exciting industry to work in. <clears throat> I always amazed when I meet people and they say things like, "I'd never want my kids to work in TV," and I think, why in the world wouldn't you want your children to engage in this fun, um, diverse, uh, challenging industry that, that it's just so rewarding. That's the great thing about working in telly. Um, and I'm lucky enough to have worked behind camera and in front of camera and, um, and I sort of earned my stripes on smaller shows, which I think is really important. <clears throat> and I think it, it's rarer and rarer and it's more, it's certainly more rarefied. It's, it's uh, the nursery slopes aren't there anymore. So people are given bigger shows early on in their career, and then they make their mistakes with the full glare of publicity, which is really unfair. So I was lucky that, that when I first started, 
late 90s, early noughties, I was able to work on shows like um, Big Brother's Little Brother, for example, and T4, with the two shows I, I, I did early doors in my career, and I helped produce Big Brother's Little Brother, that, that then you're able to make your mistakes without anyone watching. So then when you do get a big show like The X Factor, yeah, you're never going to not make mistakes. That's just natural. That's, you know, that's live television. But you serve an apprenticeship. And so by the time you do something big like, like The X Factor, and don't get me wrong, my first show, I was petrified. But at least I knew I was experienced enough to do it. And, you know, eight, nine years down the line, I still get nervous on Saturday and Sundays. But... Um, but you know, you go through the, the process in your head and you go, well, as long as I do all my homework, then um, I can't have prepped anymore. So you know, when stuff goes wrong, stuff goes wrong. But, um, but you almost want, in a weird way, it's a terrible thing to say, it's because it sounds quite perverse, but you, in an odd way, you sort of want stuff to go wrong every now and again because it's live television. So you don't want it to be fluid and you don't want it to be too polished because then why are we doing it live? You know, you want those kind of, the great moments of, of shock and, um, and unpredictability to happen. Um, but there's nothing like doing live telly, nothing. It's wonderful. The first show I was involved in the Fountain was the first pilot I ever did, which is a show called Seaside Special, which is a show commissioned by Channel 4 for a company called Chapter One. Um, and it was um, a late night summer TV show, supposed to go out on a Friday night. And it was kind of supposed to replace the word and the idea was, it's, it was kind of a celebration of summer. And I remember we hired Los Del Rio, the guys that did the Macarena. I think that's the name of the band. And they came down and we had to, and I, I'll never forget because it was the one memory of that show I have that's still etched in my subconscious when I hear that song because I'd never done a pilot before. I'd never done anything before. So I'd never really done a pilot before as a host. So I, I had no comprehension that we would have to do things again and again because if you know, director can, they will. And, uh, and these poor guys must have done seven or eight passes of the Macarena. I remember cycling to work the next day and what I should have been thinking was, to my running job, what I should have been thinking was, was I was on the way to Hammersmith. Well, that's the first day of the rest of my life and I could be a TV host and it's going to be so exciting. And all I could think was, Macarena. Hey, I was like, get that song out of my head. <laughs> Just, um, but I remember it being a very, war like for a young, young TV host, first time doing anything, it's a very, very intimidating atmosphere. And I remember this place being very warm and welcoming, early doors. Uh, and that, that kind of stuff stays with you. And then down the line, um, as I've sort of, you know, careers become a bit more established, you, you do, you'll go, you'll do sporadic kind of guest appearances here or, I think I might have shot one or two other pilots here down the years, but the one, obviously then to come back into X Factor here and to be hosting the last show that's going to be made here, for me, having started my career here, is, you know, is quite fitting for me. It's not for me to say whether it's quite fitting for anyone else, but it's fitting for me and it's also a big honour for me to be doing the last show here because um, it's a place that means a great deal. I think when I think of X Factor here, I think of, of Beyonce and Alexandra Burke. And it was, I think it was the moment where I, I mean, I knew X Factor was a massive show before I started on it. And then we obviously had the One Direction year, which we got up to 18 million and that was kind of, or just peaked at just below 20 million. That was kind of the wow moment, I guess. But I think the moment where, when Alexandra performed with Beyonce was the kind of, I think it was the first time we probably had a bona fide worldwide superstar in Fountain that I can remember on the X Factor. And I remember that being an incredible moment that we all shared. But I miss doing the final here in a weird way because Wembley Arena is a terrific place to work. But there's something about the intimacy here and, and the way we have, the way they've designed the stage and they've designed the um, studio, it feels like a coliseum. You know, you've got almost like an amphitheatre, rather. You've got that kind of, the banks are, are relatively steep. And when I first started, I remember it, I think it was around, the configuration was a bit different, so it was around the other way, so it was far more shallow. And then about halfway through my run, this turned it like that. And so the level of noise you can get back off that audience, just, it's, it's like a cacophony, it's wonderful. And it really helps the artist. But I remember, uh, yeah, definitely Beyonce. And then we had, there was a great moment here where Paul McCartney came down and, 
and I in, in, interviewed him for the first time that year. And he said, oh, I think about going on the X Factor. What do you think? And I was like, you should, I, absolutely, I think you should come down. I think you'd be well looked after. Anyway, so he came down. And uh, <laughs> well, yeah, I had to say I booked Paul McCartney, but I booked Paul McCartney. And, um, and he'd finished his sound check early. And it was a closed set. Um, but the contestants were allowed in, and obviously the camera men were in there, and the production team were in there. And he finished his set early. I think we had 20 minutes before we were going to de-rig his set and, 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 um, and get ready for the next, um, uh, next uh, rehearsal. And McCartney just sort of said over the mic, should we just jam for 20 minutes? So his band, and it was on, I remember it was on a Sunday, and his band just played for 20 minutes, and they played some Beatles numbers and some Wings numbers. And we all just sat round, just about 25, maybe 30 people in that studio, just kind of going, we didn't have anything else to do, so we were just waiting for the other, I guess the other band to turn up. Sat there just listening to a private concert of Paul McCartney. And those are the moments rather than, it's, the mo it's those little serendipitous moments rather than the, you know, the, 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 the bits of the specific bits of TV that I've made. It's more, it is more of, I talked to you about it before James, it's more the, it's more the moments where you look up and it's Sunday morning and you're rehearsing and, and uh, the scene doors open and the, and the light comes in and everyone's working around you and, and, and you know, I'm just trying to get my words in my head and my blocking and my business right so I know where I'm turning to my cameras and stuff. But I don't like being on stage on my own then. I, love, I like the fact that, you know, Nicky and the stagehand boys are kind of uh, working behind me and, you know, give me a little dig from time to time. And, you know, that for me, that's what I love about this place is it there is you get a genuine feel of team here you know there is a nice team and there's no you know for, for, for an enormous light entertainment show that has some big characters on it you never get the impression that there's just one star even Simon who's you know all of our bosses you still get the impression here that he is part of this team and I think a fountain's a lot to do with that when Sharon quit on my first show that was definitely the the, the the most formative experience that I've had at Fountain and the most form probably the most formative experience I've had in my career. Because up to then, I'm doing this little Channel 4 show and we, you know, we, we, would, we, we were exactly what we said in the team. We were big brothers, little brothers, so we were allowed to kind of get away with murder and, and have a lot of fun and, and you know, kick our big brother in the shins and run away every now and again. And suddenly here I am, I'm sort of catapulted into the big leagues and I'm trying to do the maths in my head because I'm thinking like four judges. Okay, that's cool. And then, so he's obviously going to vote for his act. They're obviously going to vote for their act. So it's obviously down to the other two judges. And then out of nowhere, what I wasn't expecting my first week is for one judge to have two acts in the bottom two. And in my head, I just thought, well, it's obviously just going to go to the best out of three. But I was expecting Sharon to opt out. And she... It was the shoes I remember, that was the key. It wasn't about the fact that she effed or blinded. It was the fact on, on Saturday night television, she kicked off her shoes. And I just I remember thinking, that's, that's odd, why would you do that? And then she went, dare me, I ain't doing it, and just walked off. And in your head, you're still going, well, there's three there, so I just know it's, I'll just go with the, with, with the other three. But you can't help, a little part of you is going inside Sharon Osman has just walked off your TV show on your first day. What have you done? <laughs> um, there's a great story afterwards where Richard Holloway, who's our uh, exec from at the time as our exec, is now, you know, uh, now runs Thames, but Richard said to, went to see her and she went, Richard, you want reality? Well, this is effing real. <laughs> Isn't that marvellous? Pure Mrs. O. That's very good. I find the atmosphere here an uh, incredibly informal one. You know most people by their name, um, whether they work in the canteen, um, the bar, reception. Um, you, it feels very, it's a very warm place. Um, I think it's a, it's a great TV studio when you go live. Um, partly because of all the reasons I've said before, you know, the way it's configured is it, it feels very, it feels kind of wall of noise. 
it's a tight studio, which is what I like. It's big, obviously it's a huge studio, but it's a tight studio as well. It doesn't feel, you know, you play some places. And I always think, my philosophy has always been, if people in the room are having a good time, people at home are having a good time. And there was, when you get to a certain size of venue, that has to go out the window. So you, if you're hosting in the O2 or Wembley, then you've got to play through the camera because the venue is too big, sort of. But when it's, what is it, 600 people here? Something like that? Hmm? 850. That's a lot. About anything less than 1,000, you can probably start playing to the room. Um, and people, I just think we, it's, a, it's just a good space for a TV. For TV you know? it's, it reminds me a bit of Television Centre. It does have that feel of history about it. It's very sad that, that, that this place is closing. And I, look, I'm not, I don't run the business that runs this place. I don't know um, how you make a studio economical. I don't know. Um, I'm sure that the people are, that are doing it aren't callous individuals that are doing it and laughing about it. But it's it's sad because this place has so much um, history to it. It has so much, you know, it's a it's a big employer. I, I, I'm always sad, don't get me wrong, I, 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 we need more houses and uh, in Brown, especially in Brownfield sites. I mean, I, I hate the idea of carpeting over the whole of the southeast of England. It feels like that's what we're doing and, and you know, without adequate infrastructure to support it. And also just, just because it's profitable doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. But this place in particular, and, and you know, I know I'm looking at it through roasting the glasses and, and from a very nostalgic perspective, but it feels, it feels like it's part of the community. And if, we if all we do is build houses on places, then you know, where does that, what does that say about us? Where does that, if we don't do things, then where does that end, you know? I think Fountain's a place I will always owe a great deal of gratitude to. It's um, a very small uh, half acre, something like that, that will always have a warm place in my heart. And I think whenever I'm lucky enough to come up to Wembley to see my football team play, whenever I'm lucky, luckily, whenever I'm lucky enough to come to Wembley to see my football team play, um, or go to the arena to see a concert, you know, I'll always have a little misty-eyed moment, I guess, when I look over here and see flats.